Okay, so back to these, construction, forestry, mining, utilities. Well, you can kind of see, maybe, that these are jobs, you can tell me if you disagree, but these seem to me to be jobs that might require more physical strength. That would certainly be the case in forestry and mining and construction, and likely in utility work too. So, and then they're also thing-like jobs, right? So these aren't, you know, there's not a lot of... <laughs> value on fostering close human relationships in these sorts of occupations, you know? So, so here, here's some interesting things. Ten most do male-dominated occupations in the U.S. So I guess one of the things that you might ask yourself is, um, do, would you be interested in a job like this? So, hypothetically, men are more interested in jobs like this than women. Brick mason, block mason, stone mason, so, you know, carving up stone. Cement masons, electrical power line installers and repairs. That's a tough job, eh? It'd be very hard to do that, like, during the ice storm. That'd be a hard job. Carpet floor and tile installers, heating, air conditioning, refrigeration mechanics, structure iron and rebar workers, bus and truck mechanics and diesel engine specialists, miscellaneous vehicle and mobile equipment mechanics, tool and die makers, and roofers. So, and those are overwhelmingly male, right? If you look on the right-hand column there, there isn't even 1% of the, the total number of, of women in those occupations isn't even 1%. You know, it's funny, you don't, you don't hear a lot of, like, gender affirmative action calls for structure, iron, and rebar worker gender equality. So, which, well, I think that's interesting, you know, if it's, if it's merely a matter of gender inequality, then why does it differ, why, what difference does it make what the category of employment is? That sort of argument shouldn't be reserved for only the upper echelons and the most desirable jobs, you know, otherwise, that's not a coherent argument, it either applies across the spectrum of jobs or it's incoherent, those are the alternatives. So, here's the ten most female-dominated occupations in the US. It's still, secretaries and administrative assistants. Now, you know, that was the most common female job in the 1950s, and it is still overwhelmingly the most common female job. So that's quite interesting, and although it's incredibly dominated by women. So, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's like, it's not that easy to tell. Childcare workers, well, that doesn't really come as much of a surprise, but it is, it is notable. And one of the things you see in the Scandinavian countries, for example, it's pretty much related to this, is that there's a, in this, in, there's a 20 to 1 difference, men versus women, in engineering, and there's a 20 to 1 women versus men difference in nursing. So, and it's, the Scandinavian governments every now and then go through a fit of, of enthusiasm about attracting more women into engineering, and so they, you know, crank up their social engineering and their and their information about how desirable a profession that is, and then the proportion of women who go into engineering rises slightly, not very much, and then as soon as they stop, you know, pushing it hard, it just drops right back down to 5%. Teacher assistants, registered nurses, bookkeeping, accounting and auditing clerks, maid and housekeeping cleaners, nursing, psychiatric and home health aides, personal and home care aides, and general office clerks. So that's where the bulk of women are in the... That's where the bulk of the female-dominated occupations are. So, let's see now, did I cover all those things? Yeah, I did. So, here's, I've been trying to figure this out for a long time, like, what this agreeableness thing is, and, and this is sort of what I've concluded. Because um, I'm always interested in tying this down to the biology, and Jak Panksepp, who's a very good neuroscientist, has identified a number of fundamental biological, emotional systems, um, some of which we've alluded to already, and some of which we really haven't. So, for example, it was Panksepp who identified the existence of a play system um, for engaging, for example, in, in rough and tumble play, and that seems to be something that males prefer more than females prefer. But he's also identified a care system, and you can think about that as the basic... It, it, there has to be a care system. I mean, for God's sake, we're mammals, right? I mean, the definition of a... A mammal is, well, first, the mammal is warm-blooded and has hair, but the next part of it is that the mammal is fed breast milk. And so, obviously, there's a dependent relationship there. And it's not only a, like, it's a dependent relationship, and it's a difficult dependent relationship. You know, like, 
Children are very um, not able to care for themselves for a very long period of time. There has to be, well, it's foolish to even argue otherwise. People fall in love with their baby, babies to a staggering degree, and the typical response of new parents is, well, I never knew it would be like this, because even if you're not interested in someone else's baby, you tend to be unbelievably interested in your own baby. And that's a good thing, because there are a lot of trouble. And so there's a system, a maternal system primarily, a care system. It's, it's a system that's shared by men, because men are also very maternal for mammals. And so, I believe that's on the one end of the agreeableness spectrum. It's like the maternal care system is what's driving empathy and sympathy and all of those things. And, you know, I, I think actually that it was the... It was the expansion of the maternal care system to include men that actually resulted in human beings' capability to pair bond. Because one of the things that's really weird about people is that they share food. Because animals aren't very good at that. Like chimps will do it a little bit, but they're not too happy about it. And wolves sort of look like they share food, but that isn't really what happens. The dominant ones just eat till they're full, and then they don't mind if you know, the subordinate ones eat what's left over. But human beings will share food. Now, of course, female mammals often share food with their infants, but they don't generally share food with you know, their, their compatriot. And you, know, you, you think about all the... Think about the language that couples who are in love use to each other. You know, there's a real infantile element to it. It's baby and deer and, you know, they make little cooing noises and they give each other little pet names. And, like there's something that's, that's like, there, there's, there's a juvenile element to it that, that seems to me to be a consequence of the activation of this care system, you know, between adults rather than from the adult to the child. And so, anyways, then on the other end, well, there's a predatory aggression system, and I think that they've, they've come together in evolutionary history to balance each other out. So, both men and women are caring and predatory. Um, women more caring and less predatory, and men more predatory and less caring. But both genders have that, both capacities within them. And I think they've evolved so that they're mutually inhibitory. So that a predatory male is not that likely to kill infants, whereas, and, and fairly likely to care for them. Now, there are exceptions to this, you know, and, and they're not trivial. So, for example, stepchildren are much more likely to be killed, especially if they're under two. You are at 100 times more risk for abuse from a step-parent than you are from a natural parent. And so you see echoes of this in the animal kingdom, too. So, for example, if an, gorillas have harems, and then, of course, one gorilla has, you know, offspring with a variety of female gorillas, then all the adolescent gorillas are sort of outside that little circle, just waiting and tapping their feet for the guy in the middle to get tired or hungry or, you know, exhausted, so they can come and run in there and, you know, overthrow them, fundamentally. When they do that, they kill all the infants. And so do lions. So, the predation and care systems, you know, they're... They're very tightly balanced, and they are influenced to a large degree by genetic similarity, rough as that is.